In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those of you who have sat through my lectures will know that I like parables, I like stories. So I want to begin by telling a story. And it's a story told by the German theologian Helmut Tillicher. And in his memoirs, Tillicher describes how one day he went for a bike ride through the beautiful black forest of southern Germany. And Tillicher had been cycling for several hours and he started to get really hungry. So he stopped off at the nearest village in search of something to eat. And in the village, his eyes alighted on this huge sign outside a shop which displayed a great big piece of delicious black forest gatto. And next to the sign with the gatto, there were various other signs advertising freshly baked bread. And so Tilika got off his bike and he walked straight into the shop and he said to the shopkeeper, please could I have a piece of that delicious black forest gatto and a loaf of that freshly baked bread just like the one on the sign outside the door. But the shopkeeper gives Tilika a bemused look and said, Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're just a shop that sells signs. <laughs> and so poor Tilika walks out of the shop and he's feeling pretty dejected and he's still really hungry. So he gets back on his bike and he starts to laugh a little bit at, uh, at what had happened. By the time he's cycled out of the village, he's weeping. Why is he crying? Not just because he's hungry. He's weeping because he realizes that he's part of a church that just sells signs. So why do I tell you the story about the Black Forest Ghetto and the shop that sold the signs? The reason is that when I read the Sermon on the Mount, and this passage from Matthew 7 in particular, I see that the true life of the church of Jesus Christ isn't to be seen in spectacular signs. The central characteristic of belonging to Jesus is not that we perform signs, wonders, miracles, or other spectacular manifestations of God's activity in Jesus' name. The crucial hallmark of belonging to Jesus is that we are a community of people living together peaceably in koinonia, in fellowship, fellowship of mutual suffering love. Now please don't get me wrong, we, we praise God for the miracles when they happen. But we also realize that actually life itself is the greatest miracle of all. Life is the great sacrament. And we see the true signs of God's activity in the world, not just in spectacular events and great deeds, but also in simple demonstrations of love, compassion, and forgiveness. If we want to think about this in relation to salvation, then we'd have to say that salvation is presented in the Gospels, particularly in Matthew's Gospel, not primarily as a matter of performing spectacular feats of healing or evangelism. But rather salvation is depicted in much more prosaic, ordinary terms as primarily a matter of demonstrating simple and even mundane acts of compassion. Feeding the hungry, giving a drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, visiting the imprisoned, recognizing the ways in which Christ comes to us in the guise of a thirsty stranger. So we need to understand Jesus' terrifying words from this passage. I never knew you. Both as a warning and as an encouragement. It's a warning because God's judgment 
is real. In fact, God's judgment is not just real, it's also really terrible. But the way that this judgment operates is usually the opposite of what we imagine. Because when we separate ourselves from our brothers and sisters in need, alleging that our Christian faith and our concern for doctrinal purity require us to remove ourselves from these brothers and sisters, then we're running the grave risk of eternal fire. Because God's judgment comes to us as the cries of the neighbor in need. We need to remember that on the great day of judgment, when we stand before the throne of God, the questions that Jesus is going to ask us are not going to be what great signs and wonders, miracles did you perform in my name. Neither is Jesus going to ask us about whether we adhere to a pre-post-tribulation or amillennial theory of rapture eschatology. Jesus isn't even going to ask us if we got a mark of 70 in our latest doctrine essay. (laughs) Rather, the questions that Jesus is going to ask us are much more simple, but much more searching, much more disturbing. Did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe that naked person? Did you visit that prisoner? Did you shelter that homeless person? Did you welcome that stranger in your midst? Did you pray and care for that brother and sister who was in need? These questions don't refer to particularly glamorous or grandiose acts that require special talents or gifts. In fact, anyone can do them. I think that's precisely the point. What Jesus seems to be saying here is that the meaning of the universe is to be found in sacrificial love, in agape, in compassion. And when we participate in Jesus' suffering agape love, we go beyond being the kind of church that just sells signs. And we start to share in the same kind of love that put the stars into space. In other words, we transition from being the kind of people who say, Lord, Lord, to being the kind of people who truly know Jesus. And even more importantly, Jesus will know and acknowledge us before God the Father. As Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Jesus said, not just in this passage, but elsewhere in the Gospels, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Those who belong to Jesus are those who actually learn to do everything that Jesus taught his disciples to do. Neither calling Jesus Lord nor even performing spectacular things in his name is a substitute to actually obeying him. So in this passage from Matthew 7, again we hear Jesus' life words spoken to us with a piercing, perceptive, prophetic clarity. So firstly we have the contrast between the wide and the narrow gates. Now despite what's often assumed, the narrow gate here is not a metaphor for doctrinal correctness. The narrow gate that Jesus is referring to is obedience. This is why we can sometimes see um, perhaps people in our churches who seem to be very correct doctrinally but who have hearts full of bitterness, envy, unforgiveness, and even hatred. Now this this point might be controversial uh, for some, but I want to suggest that as evangelicals, we've, we've often placed far too much emphasis on faith narrowly defined, and not nearly enough emphasis on 
obedience and discipleship. We can, either say, we, we can even say with Dallas Willard uh, that non-discipleship is the elephant in today's church. The thing is that we're sometimes really good at worshipping Jesus. But we're absolutely rubbish at following him. And this is because we've inherited such an impoverished understanding of faith. One of the greatest interpreters of this passage from Matthew's Gospel was the German theologian and martyr. He was killed by the Nazis. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer said that faith without obedience leads to what he called cheap grace. Cheap grace, said Bonhoeffer, is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Bonhoeffer continued, saying that costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. It is costly because it compels us to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The problem with cheap grace is that it gives rise to cheap faith, which is a truncated and impoverished understanding of faith as a kind of intellectual fidelity to a system of belief. Cheap grace leads to the kinds of churches that are like shops that sell signs. And this kind of cheap faith can sometimes function as an ideological crutch that shields us from embracing a life of radical discipleship. The kind of life that uh, Brother Simon spoke about so powerfully last week. So we've taken notions like salvation by faith alone and we've totally distorted them so that they've become completely detached from their biblical basis. So we think that grace is essentially passive and doesn't require any effort on our part. Cheap faith becomes a crutch, a comfort blanket, a pillow of certainty that helps us to sleep at night. This kind of cheap faith can produce signs, even spectacular signs, but it doesn't generate life-transforming obedience. So while I'm definitely not trying to preach a, a notion of salvation by works, let me say clearly that grace is definitely not opposed to effort. Grace is not opposed to effort. While the grace, and this is the crucial point, grace is opposed to earning, which is about our attitude. I'm obviously not saying that we earn our way to salvation by doing so-called good works or good deeds. In fact, as soon as grace works in order to receive something in return, it's not grace anymore. But we still have an urgent imperative as disciples, as followers of the risen Christ, to strive for the kingdom of God. And we enter the kingdom of God by radical obedience to Jesus' teachings. The dichotomy that often opens up between faith and works is completely dissolved, dissolved because discipleship, as a loving obedience in action, is grace by another word. When Jesus said to his disciples, without me you can do nothing, if we apply the same logic to this, then if we do nothing, it'll be without him. We're not just saved by grace, we're also redeemed by grace. We're sanctified by grace. And every part of our lives is sustained and empowered by the enabling grace of God. And we've sometimes forgotten that following Jesus is not just about professing sound doctrine or adhering intellectually to a particular creed. It's not even about uh, thinking, um, thinking about the world in a particular way. Because sometimes we can confess with our lips 
that which we deny in our hearts. Becoming a disciple of the risen Lord Jesus involves undergoing radical transformation that leads to a life of Christ-like self-denial. Loving enemies, giving away worldly goods, standing up against injustice in the name of the kingdom of God. It's about living a life of loving obedience that follows Jesus instinctively with the same reflex that causes a bird to sing or the heart to beat. So we can say that the narrow path that Jesus referred to is a metaphor for obedience and discipleship that avoids the double perils between cheap grace on the one hand and legalism on the other. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is not about affirming a particular set of beliefs or even gaining wholeness or satisfaction through conversion. Becoming a follower of Christ involves not just changing what we believe, but transforming the entire manner in which we hold our beliefs. It's one of the strange quirks of human nature, I find this absolutely fascinating, um, that we can honestly profess to believe what we in fact don't believe. And human beings seem to have this strange tendency to disavow in practice what they claim to believe. Moreover, we, we sometimes affirm one thing so as to continue to affirm precisely the opposite thing in the way that we actually live. What do I mean by this? Just to illustrate, uh, take the example of a, a little boy who's uh, undergoing therapy because he has t- a terrible relationship uh, with his father. Just a little, a little lad, and he's, uh, he's undergoing therapy. Um, and the therapist asks the boy directly, uh, do you love your father? And the little boy says, when he's asked directly, he says, yes, of course, I love my daddy. When the therapist asks, what is teddy bear thinks of daddy? The, teddy bear, the, the, the therapist finds that actually teddy doesn't like daddy at all. Teddy is deeply afraid of daddy. In fact, Teddy even hates daddy. Where do we see the truth revealed? The same principle applies to Christian doctrines that we profess with our lips but deny with our lives. We can sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that we embrace, for example, crucifixion and resurrection while avoiding it in reality. In other words, we can end up becoming like those people who cry, Lord, Lord. For instance, what does it mean to believe in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Christian belief in the crucifixion, can I suggest, is not just about accepting that a historical event happened. The fact of crucifixion means that we're not just invited to affirm or contemplate the death of Jesus on the cross, but rather it means that we're summoned to actually undergo that death in our own lives. To be crucified with Christ, to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ, to use the language of Paul. And similarly, we believe in the resurrection not just by affirming a historical fact that a man, Jesus of Nazareth, was resurrected from the dead about 2,000 years ago. That's important, and we need to affirm that absolutely. And there's very good historical and archaeological evidence uh, for that. But it's not enough just to affirm the historical fact if we want to say that we truly believe in the resurrection. We demonstrate that we believe in the resurrection not by uttering creedal statements and professing sound doctrine, but rather by becoming the site of life when the new life of Christ radiates from us and when we take a stand for life against the forces of death that surround us. This is because the resurrection is God's great yes to life. So if we profess intellectual fidelity to the doctrine of the resurrection, but at the same time 
we turn our gaze away from a suffering child. Or if we close our ears to the cries uh, of pain of a suffering sister or brother. And if the love, the goodness, the light and the life of Christ, if these don't radiate from us, then in fact we deny the resurrection. We become like the kind of people who say, Lord, Lord, and our churches become like shops that sell signs. So what does this look like in practice? How do we become the kind of people who don't just sell signs, but who embody the fullness of new life in Christ? Can I suggest that there's a chronic (coughs) deficit of compassion in our contemporary society? Many people in our society have been either left behind or intentionally ignored. We never read about them in the papers. We never hear about them in the news bulletins. These are the people who are absent from our conscious awareness. And these absent ones are usually the poor, the vulnerable, the elderly, the handicapped, the HIV positive, the herpes ridden, the prisoners, the mentally ill, the depressed. The list goes on and on and on. We don't want to hear these people because their suffering and their pain would disturb our sense of comfort and endanger our complacency but although we might have forgotten about them God certainly hasn't forgotten about them and he hears their cries the practice of compassion as taught by Jesus particularly in the Sermon on the Mount would show us that no sister or brother deserves to be excluded and pushed on to the bleak margins Where life is nothing but sheer pain and endurance. To have compassion, pity and mercy on those who suffer is an absolute, non-negotiable, gospel imperative. And we actually discover that in loving others we come face to face with God in the face of the other. We've often made the mistake of thinking that Jesus' great commandment to love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. We've often thought that these are two commandments. They're not. It's one commandment. We demonstrate that we love God not by waving our arms around in a worship service on a Sunday morning. Not by making hollow professions of romantic love to Jesus but rather we love God by loving our brothers and sisters the people in our churches the people you meet on the street the people sitting next to you right now you want to know what the Bible says about us if we claim to love the God that we haven't seen while at the same time we don't love the the brother or the sister who's sitting next to us right now The word of God is quite clear on this point. It says that we're liars and hypocrites. Liars and hypocrites. Read 1 John chapter 4 if you don't believe me. We become like those fake Christians who say Lord, Lord, but who don't really know Jesus. And even more tragically, Jesus doesn't know them. And Jesus will say, Away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So just to say in closing, as a church, as a a college, as church leaders, but most of all as disciples, as followers of the risen Lord Jesus, let's not be like a church that sells signs. But let's be a radical community of Jesus following his example not just by adhering intellectually to sound doctrine important though that is Graham (laughs) but also 
but also by costly participation in Jesus' death and resurrection. And let's not be afraid to embrace all the joys, as well as the pain, the suffering, and the vulnerability that this kind of radical discipleship necessarily involves. But most of all, and this is the most important point, let's remember the goodness, the mercy, and the compassion of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has promised to be with us even unto the end of the age. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.